Welcome to Walking in Grace, presented by Grace Bible Church in Portage. Join us Sunday mornings at 9 at 2939 County Highway CX, next to Edgewater Greenhouse in Portage. You can also visit us online at gbcportage.com. Today we continue the Foundational Framework Sermon Series with Pastor Jeremy Edmondson. So we're looking at the evidence of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' life. We're not venturing into the church age. And the reason why is just because chronologically speaking, we're not there yet. Uh, The Holy Spirit does a lot more in moving forward, uh, actually going from the place of abiding with or remaining with the apostles to the point to where he will indwell the apostles and anyone who is a believer in Christ after Acts chapter 2. And it's important uh, that we understand that. Otherwise, if we just stopped with the teaching of Jesus, we might become discouraged Uh, a little quickly of why the Holy Spirit is not something more permanent. I hope today that you would take comfort in the fact that he is. Uh, We see the Holy Spirit present in the idea of Jesus's conception. We see the Holy Spirit present in his baptism. We see the Holy Spirit present in all the works that Jesus uh, did. In fact, all the works that he said he attributed that to the work of the Holy Spirit in his life that testified to the fact that the kingdom of God had come upon people and was holding them to a point of maximum accountability because he is the promised Messiah that the previous 39 books, the Old Testament, constantly pointed towards. So where are we at now? We're in a very interesting section of Scripture. If you're familiar with how Scripture is divided up in John Verses, sorry, chapters 13 through 16 is commonly what is known as the upper room discourse. And this is the last accumulation of teaching that Jesus was giving to his disciples before his betrayal and arrest, mock trial, and crucifixion. And what he is doing in this situation is he is preparing them for this transition. He is trying to get them in a hope attitude related to when he will not be with them in a physical presence. These disciples have spent between three and four years following Jesus. They left everything that they had. They gave up their businesses that they were involved in, and they've spent time listening to his teaching over and over, day after day, watching his miracles, being completely impressed with who he is. And when they're called to give account for their confession, we agree with Peter. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. We understand this. From all the exposure that we've had, this is who you are. There's nowhere else to go but to be with you. You have the words of life. And so after at the supper, whenever Jesus reveals to John, and it seems that he reveals to John only, that Judas is the one who will betray him by taking bread, dipping it in a dish, and handing it to Judas, Judas leaves. And now you have some extremely relevant and profound teaching that Jesus wants to assure them before certain tragedy is going to hit them. And here's the reason why. Jesus wants to speak words of truth to them so this tragedy will not overcome them. And one of the greatest things that he is explaining to them is the promise of the Holy Spirit. To get an idea of what's going on with this, let's first look at John 13. And if you were to go and read this section, chapters 13, 14, 15, 16, you would notice a reoccurring theme of the idea of love and what it is to love. Now, what it is to love is a completely separate sermon that I am going to do my darndest to stay away from today, but I can't guarantee that my pinky toe is not going to wander over in it, okay? But in John 13, 34, and 35, Excellent words. Notice what it says. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Now, we already talked about one another this morning, didn't we? So you already know who that is. But notice what it says after that. Even as I have loved you. Uh Uh-oh. There's the level of love. Because, oh, I'm supposed to love everybody. And then in the back of our minds, our our flesh, our carnal sinful nature is going, but how much do I really have to love them? I love that Jesus squelches all questions, right? He just gets rid of it now. Even as I have loved you, 
that you also love one another. This is exactly what Roxanne said. By this, all men will, what's the word? No. Now, I can't help it. But if you want to talk about evangelism and how to reach people in a dying world that seems obstinate to the very idea that God exists, if love was being demonstrated for one another as Christ loved us in the church, I guarantee you that begins to pour out of the church. Because wherever you go in your social circles, you take that with you. Does that make sense? So notice, all men will know. They'll know it. It's undeniable. They will know that you are my disciples if... Anybody know what that little word, if, is called, if you're breaking down doing sentence diagramming? It's called a contingency. The idea that everybody knowing is contingent on something taking place. If you love one another. But guess what? If you don't love one another, the world doesn't care because you're just like them. Everybody see this difference? See, Jesus is giving us a mandate of how we make a difference in people's lives. We may be scared to death to talk to somebody about Christ. Guess what? That's okay. As long as you're worried about loving people as Jesus has loved us in the body of Christ, that's just going to happen. You don't have to psych yourself up in order to go talk to somebody. It just overflows on them. You might get a little bit of love on them. They'll like that. I guarantee you. Why? Because let's be honest, guys, we live in a loveless society. We do. Everything that we think love is, it's not. But this sermon's not about love. It's about the Holy Spirit. Everybody see why this is so hard? Good grief. So knowing this, this this is kind of a a setting of of a statement that stretches throughout this entire four chapters of teaching. Okay? Now what we want to be most concerned with is his teaching on the Holy Spirit. So if you would, drop down to chapter 14. And I want you to look at verse 15, and I think this is important. And the reason why I'm going to camp on this and show it to you is because it's brought up three times in this chapter. Three times he makes this statement and he speaks of the benefits of it. I'm not going to be able to not talk about love here. Verse 15, if you love me, stop. Everybody look up, look up. Don't look at your Bibles. Look up, look up, look up. Black the screen, black the screen. Take the screen out. Black it out. Black it out. Okay. (laughs) Do you love Jesus? Don't be so hasty to answer. Because we need to take note of this, guys. Who is Jesus talking to in this passage? Why is Jesus talking to already saved people about what it is to love him? I mean, if they're saved, shouldn't they automatically love him? Not according to Jesus. See, I think this is important. Because what the world has taught us what love is, is not what Jesus, the giver of truth, the one who defines what is true, says love is. Now, this is important. Okay? Stick with me. So notice, if you love me, go ahead and bring it back up. What does it say? You will what? You will keep my commandments. In other words, Jesus measures a love for him based on our obedience to what he has said. You know what? We're going to study the Holy Spirit next week. We got to talk about it. We got to. I can't help it. Do you love Jesus? Of course I love Jesus. How dare you say that? Didn't Peter love Jesus? Of course I love you, Jesus. I'll go with you anywhere. Guess what? You're going to deny me three times. You just professed you would die for me. But when you're held to task, everybody see it? In fact, what's interesting is, is when you look at some of the translations in the Greek, when it talks about the third time, girl comes up to him. You were with Jesus in the garden, weren't you? He actually curses at her. Can you imagine Peter 
foul mouth, fresh off the sea, Sailor Peter, chewing out a girl because she dared associate him with Christ. Everybody see this? So it's not any... It's not that odd when we look at what transpires afterwards in time that Jesus would be sitting down with 11 people, Judas is already gone, 11 people who have followed him, forgive the pun, but religiously, and in doing so, if, contingency, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Now watch what goes on here. We'll go ahead and hit this. I will ask the Father. So Jesus is going to ask God for something. And he will give you another helper. Another helper. Grasp this. Another helper. Which means, who is the current helper? Jesus is their current helper. I'm going to give you another like me. In fact, do me a favor. Everybody put your finger here. Turn over to 1 John. And look at this relationship, because John understands this. If you, if you can read the Gospel of John and connect it with 1 John, you will see common themes stretching back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And what you find is, and that sounds kind of odd, but John isn't saying anything that Jesus didn't already teach him. It's really fantastic. It really is. So watch this. 1 John chapter 2, look at verse 1. My little children... I am writing these things to you so that, here's the reason, you may not sin. That you may not be committing sin in your life. Are you saying that we have the capacity for sinless perfection? No, but what I'm saying is, is that after you believe in Jesus Christ, and at this point the Holy Spirit was residing in every believer, if that is the case, you don't have to sin. You can say no to sin. Before Jesus, we were all dead to God and alive to sin. So all that we did was sin. Bill Gates gives millions of dollars to blind kids. Guess what? Still sin. How can you say that? That's a good thing. Because his motives are not about glorifying God and God getting the glory in the end. It's not about doing it so that God's name would be revered amongst people. So it is sin. Well, that's being really nitpicky. Well, Jesus cares about the heart, not the actions. David was even brought to that conclusion. Psalm 51, he's confessing to the Lord against you and you alone if I sinned. Because I got with a girl that was not mine, actually belonged to somebody else, and then to cover it up, I had murder take place so that no one would find me out. Was David operating in unbelief? Good grief. The omniscient, omnipresent God. No one will know. No one will find out. Our sin so deludes us from those things that really, really matter. And So notice, John can't afford to play around here. He's writing these things in this book to encourage you not to sin. Don't sin. It's not worth it. It's not worth it knowing one swing of the hammer to drive the nails into the wrist of Christ was all due because I can't keep from lying to someone because I don't really want to tell them the truth. That's insane when you weigh that out. Sin is completely irrational for the person that knows Jesus Christ. So don't do it. But here's the thing. As with all things, he has mercy and grace in it. And if anyone sins... We have an advocate, an advocate. Everybody see that word? Advocate, everybody see it? Yes. Who's asleep? Do you see it? Do you have 20-20 vision? Okay. So notice. (laughs) That's great. See, I love the honesty. So notice, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the what? Righteous. Everybody see this word advocate? Turn back to John. John 14, 16. I will ask the Father. He will give you another advocate. Another helper. Some of your translations will say another comforter. 
That's not bed comforter. That is, he's actually here to comfort you. Some of your translations might say counselor. The Greek word here is paraclete or parakletos is the idea. Para means to come alongside. Kletos means to call or invite is the idea. So the literal rendering of the word is that this is one who has been called or invited to come alongside you and to stand with you. I am going to send you someone that is going to, and and, and everybody hold on to it, because I get that the Holy Spirit is a spirit, but go with me on this and try to wrap your mind around it, that will physically replace Jesus in the lives of believers in such a way as to where not only will he be with them as he is at this moment as Jesus is with them, but in Acts chapter 2, when the church starts, he will then reside within them. Does that make sense? So this idea of him being a comforter, a counselor, some people have said, well, it's an advocate like he's pleading your case. No. The Holy Spirit does not plead your case before the Father. The Son of God pleads your case before the Father. How do you know that? Because he's the one with the blood that paid the price. Didn't John just tell us if we sin, if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father? The stand between. Jesus Christ, the what? Righteous. What qualifies Jesus as righteous? Well, he's God. Is that it? What qualifies him as righteous? He never sinned. Romans 10.4, Christ is the end of the law for everyone who believes. Keep faith, faith, but notice. The righteous requirement that's demanded through the law of God, Jesus fulfilled it, and Jesus is the end of it. When he was hanging on the cross and he cried out, it is finished, to tell us die, the words actually mean paid in full, done. In other words, church, don't worry about the law. I've saved you from that. I've redeemed you from that. So if we were to go through the Gospels and we were to look at Jesus' interaction with the disciples, and let's be honest, if anything, you see that Jesus must be God because of the amount of patience it takes to work with these 12 individuals, yes? Yes. Oh, yeah, amen, exactly. Imagine, it's almost like you've got 12 four-year-olds running around all the time, and Jesus is just as cool as a cucumber the whole time. It's great. So notice you see the patience, the love, the care, the guidance, the direction, the help, even challenging and convicting and provoking them in the same way that God, sorry, in the same way that Jesus is all of those things unto the disciples, so the Holy Spirit will be all of those things to them as well. Does that make sense? Different roles to fulfill, different capacities to withhold. As Jesus was alongside them, the Holy Spirit will then be in them. Everybody see the difference? Okay. Everybody stick with me here. This is great. I love it. So notice, give you another helper that he may be with you how long? No, not just forever. 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 The Sandlot, anybody? Okay, just making sure. Good, you know it. Forever. He's not going to leave. It's not going to happen. He never goes away. Now, don't answer out loud, but think for a second. Am I a believer in Christ? Don't answer out loud. Just think. If you're a believer in Christ, and the Holy Spirit will be with you forever, What does that tell you? What does that tell you about God's grace towards you? You cannot lose your salvation. Otherwise, forever means something very different than all eternity. You know what it also tells you? Not only are you sealed up by the Holy Spirit, but get this, you are never alone. You are never alone. Guys, Thankful for the snow because we didn't have it in Indiana. Winter's depressing. I don't even need to talk to anybody to know it because when I walk by Walmart, 
Vitamin D is gone. <laughs> All of it. Gone. I mean, I'm kind of wondering, uh, where's Louise? Where's she at? Hey, tell them. Jack that price up twice. Oh, man. It's like five bucks a bottle, ten bucks a bottle. People are still going to buy it out. Because they are looking for something to satisfy the loneliness and the bleakness and how everything feels gray. Now, let me tell you about what you have for free. You have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit never leaves. The Holy Spirit is never gone. The Holy Spirit is always listening. The Holy Spirit is always ready, always guiding, always helping, always beside you because he's been called to be so. And not only that, he indwells in you. Holy Spirit is a beautiful, incredible act of the grace of God. And the Holy Spirit is God himself. God himself through the Holy Spirit resides in you and I. Talk about the outpouring benefits of being a believer in Christ. That's sweeter than biscuits right there. That's some good stuff. He will be with you forever. Now, stop right here. Turn over to 7, John 7. I want to show you a little something here. Jesus is at the Feast of Booths. Or if you're familiar with a little bit more, uh, probably King James language, a Feast of Tabernacles is what it's normally called. And he does something really odd. Of course, that's not like Jesus to do anything odd, is it? But he does. And we got to deal with it. We got to make sense of it because he brings the Holy Spirit into the idea here. Okay? Now watch this. Chapter 7, look at verse 37. Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, the Feast of Booths, you see that in verse 2 of this chapter, so that's how we know what we're dealing with. Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Now, stop. Have you ever been to Pizza Ranch and this happened? Does anybody think this is odd? You're at Paul Bunyan sucking down on those donuts they give you first thing out there? Next thing you know, somebody jumps up and said, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink! (laughs) There is symbolism in everything I do. (laughs) Would that capture your attention? Yes, but the first thing you'd be saying is, what in the world is going on? Honey, open your purse. We're putting these donuts in there, and we're leaving right now. (laughs) That's what would happen. You're out of there, because it's so odd, unless there's a reason. What was that? What was that? The Holy Spirit? Okay, good. The interesting thing about the Feast of Tabernacles was, every day for the feast, The priest that year would go over to a pool there in Jerusalem, the Pool of Siloam. He would get out a big jar of water, probably more larger, take it over, and he would go to the altar, and he would pour out the water all over the altar every day, the Feast of Booths. And the reason why he would do that is because it was always pointing to the time that the Messiah would return. And so when Jesus stands up and he yells out in front of everyone, if anyone is thirsty, come to me and drink, is the idea. He is doing it in relation to this constant plea for the Jewish people, Lord, bring our Messiah, Lord, bring our Messiah, Lord, bring our Messiah. And here's what he's saying, I am the Messiah, and I'm not just the Messiah, I'm the giver of life. Look what he says in 38. He who believes in me, now stop, because he just defined for you what he meant by using the idea of drinking. It's a metaphor for believing. So notice, he who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being, it actually means out of his belly. Okay, notice this. Out of his belly, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Everybody remember the woman at the well in Samaria? 
Lord, please give me this living water that I'll never have to draw again. He offers living water. One drink satisfies forever. Why? Because the life that he gives is eternal. So now watch this, because here's a beautiful thing if you've ever read through the Gospel of John. John takes a moment and gives you a verse of commentary so you know that's what, what's going on here. Look at 39. But this he spoke of the what? The Spirit, whom those who believed in him, watch this, were to receive, for the Spirit was not yet given, and it gives you the reason why. Because Jesus was not yet glorified. Notice that John in his commentary here has told you, here's what Jesus is referencing, and here's the reason why we love it, is because if we believe in the inspiration of the Scripture and the inerrancy of the Scripture, the fact that it's Holy Spirit inspired, as this church affirms we do, then what we find out is is that John's commentary about what Jesus said is also inspired by the Holy Spirit. So he's telling the truth on how to interpret everything. And all the hermeneutes in this room said, amen, right? Thank you for doing the work for me, John. That's great. He spoke of the Spirit. When the Spirit comes to the point where he's indwelling people, it becomes a wellspring of living water within that person. It becomes something that completely satisfies. Now stop. Are you completely satisfied with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? See, that's a question we have to answer. Because life is full of dissatisfaction, yes? No one, everybody here has got, your life is to the nines all the time. You see what I'm saying? Anybody ever feel like something's missing? Sometimes I wonder, because church people are often scared to death of the Holy Spirit. Don't talk about him too much. It's not Voldemort, man. We're okay. But sometimes people get strange about the Holy Spirit, and they deem the Holy Spirit strange. Some of that is left over from the Holy Ghost verbiage that was used from him, right? If you ain't like Casper, you don't want anything to do with him. Some of us have had more of extreme teachings on it that were really guilt-laden, if we had to be honest about it. Or we were conned into this idea that we needed to experience a second blessing of the Spirit that need to take place in order for us to truly be saved. I'll, I'll never forget it. Guys, you have never seen anything until you've seen me sitting in a messed up Toyota Corolla in the passenger seat, six months freshly on fire with God. This guy has got us positioned where we see nothing but cornfields right here. We're at the end of a road. And he's sitting there going, I mean, he's just speaking in tongues going crazy. And he's looking over at me, and he's like, if you really want the blessing of God and to know that you're saved, you'll do this. You know, and I'm like, "Mm, Nipsey Russell. (laughs) I got nothing. And you know what, guys? I almost set down my Bible and walked away. I was this close to being done with Christianity because all of a sudden the Savior that was supposed to be sufficient was not sufficient. All of a sudden, everything I was told that I needed was in Jesus. All of a sudden, it wasn't there. He was essentially letting me know, well, there's cracks in that armor, and so we need to fill those in to make it okay. And it was almost damaging to my faith. So a lot of abuses of the Holy Spirit are often promoted that make us fearful. Let me say this. If you are a believer in Christ, you undoubtedly have the Holy Spirit indwelling in you at this moment. But just because you have the Spirit indwelling you doesn't mean that you have positioned yourself to receive the blessings that the Holy Spirit wants to bring into your life. Thank you for listening to Walking in Grace, presented by Grace Bible Church in Portage. If you have any questions or comments, please contact us at P.O. Box 534, Portage, Wisconsin, 53901, or email us at gracebibleportage at gmail.com. If you've missed any episodes of Walking in Grace, you can listen on our website at gbcportage.com. Scroll down to the Walking in Grace link. 
Also, you can join us Sunday mornings at 9 at Grace Bible Church, located at 2939 County Highway CX, next to Edgewater Greenhouse in Portage, Wisconsin. Or you can join the live stream on YouTube or our website at gbcportage.com. Thanks again for listening to Walking in Grace.